Man, it's a good thing we got a bunch of new ones tonight because all the old ones stayed on. I was telling Murph, it used to take snow and ice or a tornado or something. Now just good West Texas breeze and small breeze. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a light, just a light little breeze in preparation for a big shower. Yeah, how many of y'all believe it'll rain someday? Just don't know what day. Yeah, well, I'll just let you know, it it wasn't bad doing chores tonight. <laughs> just a little inside joke. <laughs> All right, it's good to have everybody tonight. We're going to get Murphs. We're going to sing a little bit. We've, uh, I think we've got some good stuff to talk about out of the Bible tonight with all the new people that's here tonight, though. Uh, man, we're glad to have you. Uh, we hope you come back. Uh, if you don't, we won't chase you down. And so uh, that'll be totally up to you. But one of the things that we're most important in our life is to learn the Bible in a way that you can go home and live. Live it at your kitchen table where you actually work, where you live, where the God's most famous favorite youth group is. You know, mom and dad and chores. That's that's the that's the ultimate and then we work down from there. So, uh, that's why we do what we do. There's things going on in the world today that are causing a lot of question, causing a lot of anxiety, a lot of different things going on. Yet at the same time, we've got some good things going on. We've got some revival sparking in some different places and and some different things that that appear to be totally legitimate. And so as that spreads, and so tonight we're going to talk about some of that. But if you're here tonight, you won't hear anything but straight out of the Bible or straight out of our history or and then whatever that is, we'll take that and and move forward. But I think tonight will be a a really good word, and for everybody that's tuned in on the thing, tonight I think will be a real encouragement, trying to figure out some of the hows and whys. And before I pray to get started here, the whole idea of learning the Bible is not to predict the future. A lot of people do that because that's appealing to the human nature. We want to know how it's going to happen. So that's how you come up with stuff that says, God is in control in a world where the prince of the air has the greatest influence. And so, or everything happens for a reason, or I read the end of the book and we win. Humans would like to know how this works. How many of you have prayed for something fervently and it worked out completely different than you had planned, but God was in it the whole time? Well, so you there you go. You can't predict the future. You can stand around, wish all you want to, and pray all you want to. And sometimes, you sometimes God's moved by that. Sometimes there's a different thing going on. We don't know everything, and so in examination of the Bible from the Old Testament up, you see the patterns of God, how God reacts to humans as they react to Him. It's over and over and over and over. That's how you train a horse. You just do it over and over and over till it sticks. There are days that I think humans might be dumber than horses. But if we will see those patterns over and over, and then you watch in history how that worked out, you'll have a little better idea. The Bible tells us that you'll recognize the changing of the seasons. But then the Bible also says that even if you know that there's a ring around the moon at night and it might rain tomorrow, you still don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. But God's with you the whole time. The whole idea is to do this with peace, understanding, with faith, where you're not shaking, you're not turned upside down. I told some pastors I've been visiting with all week. I mean, it's just been a crazy week. And all week, I said, you know, what about Asbury? What about Asbury? Man, that's awesome. And this deal and this deal. Man, it's great. It's great. 
But I'm not going to jump up and run over there until I know God's directed me to do so, until something says, hey, let's go do this. So I'm not going to be moved by the good stuff any more than I'm moved by the bad stuff. I'm not going to run around and go store me a bunch of eggs because there's a conspiracy theory about burning up chicken houses. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be moved by that. Just going to live in the moment. I'm going to be where I am today. And in the morning, you get up, you're going to be right where you are. If God tells you to do something, it'd be in your best interest to do what he tells you to do. If you can't hear him, get where you can. Start understanding God's word and understanding God and the patterns of God. It'd be good for America to understand the patterns of God. When God's people would get out of line, he'd fix them. We don't want to be fixed. We want to be petted on. We don't want to be fixed. You know, we'd just rather cuddle up with God and say, I'm sorry and I won't do it again. And then the next time, forgive me, God, for lying to you the last time. And here we are again. God fixes stuff. And so there's a lot going on. And I think as we examine the Bible, especially these seven letters, God's directives to us on his bigger picture, his bigger plan, how we fit in that, how we find peace in that, and how we move in that. And so for all you newbies around here tonight, that's what we do. We don't have church services, so to speak. We're here to learn the Bible. We're here to figure some things out so that we can go home better than we came in. We're also here to expose the kingdom of God. For everybody that walks in here that thinks that God's up here and we're down here and the old tricks to get from here to here, I'm here to tell you today God's here. And as soon as you realize it, you'll have a revival. Because revival is simply where humans encounter God and they react. And when multiples begin to do it, and it begins to take a length of time, we call it revival, but it's simply awakening is all it is. God did not come and go. God did not come and go. Humans were awakened to the presence of God. My prayer is that people will experience that here so you can experience it at home and where you live and where you dwell, okay? Now, because of that, I'm going to continue with my prayer thing like we've been doing last week where I just want to pray under the power of the Holy Spirit and pray on the battlefield, the spiritual battlefield. And so tonight, I know there's some things to pray for. So if you just just join with me, and if you want to bow your head and pray, if you want to stand up and praise, I don't care what you do, but I want you to to soak this in, men, so you can go home and stand at the threshold of your door and pray against the things that come against your family, come against your business, come against your generations, your community, your country. Men, women, I want you to pray too. Pray that your men will get it so that men will stand up and pray in the power of the Holy Spirit And I think when we start praying, finally, praying, I want to add one other little thing right quick. We've been doing this for a long time and 20 years in this town. Let me tell you what you're experiencing right now today in the last three or four days, what's been going on for several months. We didn't have to do this. We did not have to do this. There were things we could have got right as a people. And we turn to deaf ear to God's word, deaf ear to God's prophets, the warnings. We turn to deaf ear, and we're enjoying the consequences. You know why you're not hearing anybody announcing now from the pulpits or anything else, which they've minimized for 20 years, pray for rain, pray for rain, pray for rain. You know why? Because they don't believe it'll happen. I don't either. I don't either. I believe in the judgments of God. And I believe in seven-year periods of drought, famine, and pestilence. I believe that God uses the forces of nature and different things as he's done throughout the Bible.
to bring his people back into line. So, while we preach tonight with the wind blowing, he has given us many, many opportunities in this community, in this area, to get it right. Many opportunities to get it right. And in Portales, New Mexico, they're going to have a cannabis festival. Celebrate. Yeah, so don't tell me what a good job we're doing. Left the gate down and the goats took over. So, next week I'm teaching on the synagogue of Satan and I do have a picture of a goat or a goat riding on the back of a sheep. <laughs> Just, it's like in real time, it's for real. Yeah. So anyhow, let's let's pray right quick. Everybody that wants to pray. Lord Jesus, I just come to you tonight. <coughs> and Lord, we come to pray with power in the spiritual realm. Lord, as I've mentioned, a cannabis festival in Portales. Lord, forgive us. I'd, I'd love to in my flesh just ask you to smite the whole thing. But, Lord, it's by our request. It's by our doing. It's at, it's at our beckoning that all this stuff has entered our communities. Lord, this community itself has turned a deaf ear to your prophets, turned a deaf ear to everything you've ever wanted to do, and we've allowed the, the reins of, of, of the unbelievers, the uncovenanted, to rule. Lord, we've not listened to your precepts, principles, and ordinances. So tonight, Lord, I pray for your people. I pray for your people that we would stand up and pray and that we would believe and that we would walk out Scripture, that we'd walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> we'd not get all religious and tangled up in our own thinking, but, Lord, that we'd be given over to the Word of God, that we'd think different than the rest of the world, we'd believe different than the rest of the world, and we'd take dominion over Satan, his temptations, his deception, and everything that he's doing in our society, that we not allow the footprints of evil to enter into our homes or our covenanted property. That, God, we would begin to live in union in our marriages and with our families. That we take responsibility for our children and not just hand them over to the students of Pharaoh. <coughs> but, Lord, that we would be receptive to your word and that we would be persistent in our way of life. So, Lord, tonight I just pray and stand against the forces of evil. Lord, I tonight ask you when the time has come, when the time has come and you see the hearts of your people, whether it be two or 200,000, that, Lord, you would bring the rain to this dry land. But first, Lord, let the spiritual rain be seen to humankind. Just as in Asbury and different places, God, where it, <coughs> it seems like the curtain has been ripped back again, where people are realizing and are being awakened to your reality and truth. Lord, I pray that it'll happen right here. That we as a people would repent before you, a holy God. Help us, Lord, to do our best and do our best towards you. And Lord, we push back the forces of evil that want to steal the next generation. Lord, I want to thank you right now for that next batch, this next group that's coming out of revival that'll be truly born again, truly on fire, truly filled, truly empowered, truly live with purpose, do it to your glory, and I'm ready for a generation of Daniels, of Shadrachs, Meshach, and Abednegoes being raised up this day for the future persecutions that come. So, Lord, that's my word tonight, and I thank you for that, Lord, and ask you to keep us under your wing. Keep this next batch under your wing, that, Lord, as we move forward, as we move forward and the forces of evil tend to come against us, help us stand and pray and pray in power and do it all to your glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Psalms 113, and it's this is a not a suggestion. This is a command. It says, "Praise the Lord." Praise the Lord. There you go. Praise the Lord. And if that don't work, it says, "Praise, O servants of the Lord." 
So if you're serving the Lord, it says praise, right? Praise, bless the name, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to, the, to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory above the heavens, who is like our God, our, uh, our, our Lord, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. And then this is where today came, comes in. He raises the poor out of the dust. Anybody see any dust today? Anybody feel a little bit poor? He lifts the needy out of the ash heap and he, that, we, that he may sit him with princes. So, praise the Lord at the end. It says, praise the Lord. So, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's stand up and sing. Hey, we did have, we won't get into details, but we had a pretty neat deal last week. When I asked Murph to close in prayer, God had already started dealing with him just seconds before. And uh, that was a pretty neat, pretty neat how God does all that, orchestrates all that, gets all that put together. While we were worshiping there, um, I'm probably just a tick behind, but I'll catch up. But come the month of April, on the 5th of April, we're going to have the water tank up. We've got people, coffee with the colonel people. They're coming a long ways. Different ones are driving in to be baptized. They've, they've heard the need or felt the need to be baptized. So we'll have the water up on the 5th of April, and I just want to announce that because anybody else that's getting that nudge, anybody else that's being drawn to that, you know, I used to be a little more spontaneous about it, and I'm kind of figuring out if I'll set it up ahead of time. It gives people time to kind of mull it around and show up with some gym shorts or something, you know, and give, get, cut them a break instead of just having to dive in and ride home wet. So uh, so that'll happen on April the 5th. Right after that will be Passover and Resurrection Sunday. I don't know exactly how that's going to work, but I'm pretty sure Passover Passover comes on Wednesday. It begins on dusk on Wednesday and go all the way through Thursday there, whatever week that is. And uh, and we'll be doing something here different than usual on that Wednesday night. I don't know exactly what that looks like yet, uh, a night of prayer and renewing covenant. And, and I don't know, there's a lot mulling around here for a minute. We'll see how God directs all that. We'll be getting with everybody. I think it'll be a time where... I'm really sensing that not just this little group, we need to do something. God's calling us to do something area-wide. And I don't know what that looks like yet, but I will here and there too. So we'll we'll get on with that. Now, for those of you who have been following along every week, we're in Acts chapter 2, or Revelation chapter 2, excuse me, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. Last week we talked about the persecuted church, the church of Smyrna. I want to read through this again right quick, and then we're going to talk about some things tonight. It says, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write these things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. Talking about Jesus. I know your works, tribulation, poverty, but you're rich. So last week we talked a lot about being rich towards God. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Pretty good chance we're going to cover that next week. So that's why I got my goat and my sheep getting ready. So do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Here's where we're going tonight. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So tonight, we'll see how far we get, but the Lord just been dealing with me on a lot of stuff with all of this. But that persecution, this is all in real time. When John's writing this letter, it's all coming in real time. And so when he tells them, hey, Smyrna, some of you are going to jail for 10 days. I didn't mean 11. That didn't mean 9. Some of you are going to jail for 10 days. There's something coming. People know there's something coming. Do you know what's not been preached in this country for 150 years? We replaced it with the great escape. 
But the truth is persecution's coming. Persecution's coming. As we watch the dismantlement of the man-made institutions, the one single most important institution is the institution of religion, which is supposed to be the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God who are in covenant with God, empowered with the Spirit of God. We've replaced that with man-made religion that takes on this facade of a, of a, a form of godliness, denying the power thereof, is what the Bible says. Who, what's the entity in the earth that's supposed to push back the forces of evil that have brought crud into your schools and into your government and into your lives and into your kitchen tables and your community and everywhere? Who's supposed to be holding that back? Pharaoh up in Washington? Yeah, that, that, that herd up there, they can't hardly get to working back every morning anymore. We are. Us. And so when when we look at all this and and we've given the reins over to all these man made institutions to control our lives. And even after March of twenty twenty, we're still going to church every week and singing Kumbaya and never stopping to admit what an absolute complete failure we were. And 21 years ago, we did it, and we never admitted it again. The forces of evil smack into the buildings of our country, put a whole country on standstill. So everybody floods to church for three weeks, and you've heard me say this a million times. We had our Tom Bedette moment. The lights were on, and nobody was home. And they went to church, and then we went back home. What the heck? Man, wouldn't that have been a good time for a little revival? Yeah, nothing happened, did it? And yet we never repented. We never stopped and said, what's the matter with us? What's the matter with the way we're doing this? We have a whole country that's afraid. We have a whole country that's in need. We're the ones that are responsible for this. And we don't take any responsibility for it. And we don't look around and go, why wasn't this better? Why wasn't this different? You know why? We didn't have anything to lose. We went on about our lives. We didn't even recognize when Pharaoh was getting his grip on us. Do you realize that two weeks after 9-11... We invented something called zero interest. That's when that all came. George W. Zero interest. We're going to get the country rolling again. How many of y'all have been tricked by zero interest your entire life? Well, I can buy that. It doesn't cost no extra. It's zero interest. You don't think them smart guys uptown didn't figure that in ahead of time? But we've got you on the deal, and believe me, I'm guilty as charged. We've got you on the books. Now we know who you are. We've got your address, phone number, and your credit card number. We got you. These are the things that's been going on and then controlling and ruling our life. <coughs> so when you get down to the nitty-gritty of things, and I'm not a doomsdayer, because as for me and my house, I believe we're going to be fine. I just don't think it's going to be easy. We want it easy. And so then you go all the way. We muddle around, go all the way through a couple of recessions. And, you know, it's like the last recession we just had or whatever that was supposed to be. <laughs> the only reason we had one is because people on the news said we was having one. Yeah, I had a guy right up to me at a team rope in here a while back, and he said, hey, what the? Uh, what do you think about this horse market and this economy? I said, well, the horse market's pretty darn good. And he said, yeah, but what about this economy? I said, what economy? You're here. You're the team roping. I know where you live. It costs you 100 to get here. And I know your entry fees are at least 300 I want to know what economy, the one you're living in or the one they told you about? Which one is? 
That's the truth of the matter. We're so inundated with information, all controlled by the forces of evil, changing the minds and attitudes of men. What do they do? Create fear. Creates fear. Fear of the future. Fear of the moment. Fear of the situation. They practice it on this March of 2020. Here comes the Chinese virus. Yeah, I'm telling you, it's, there's people who suffered a lot of loss at whatever that thing was. But there's a lot that didn't. Okay? There's a lot of people that didn't run scared. There's a lot of people that made some right choices, and there's some people made some really bad choices, and they're realizing that now. There's a difference between making a choice out of wisdom and making a choice out of fear. Yeah. When you hire the father of all lies and pay him more than you pay the president, and you leave him on the job for four years? Holy buckets. To create fear and anxiety. What happens when you do that? You remember me telling you guys one time, I said, here's what's wrong with the church today. We've not been in enough bar fights. We ain't been knocked on our keister enough to learn how to get up and swing. We just been kind of sitting around and just having it easy. Our gen my generation is the easiest generation in the history of this country. We're the give up generation in this country. My batch. We gave up sanctity of life. We gave up sanctity of marriage. We gave up our education system. We gave up our religious liberties in our in our in our uh, uh, government-owned entities. We gave up prayer in school. Yeah, that's a, that's on me. I was living during all that. So I'll talk more about that here in a minute. <coughs> but here's the deal. Just to let you know, as we progress down this road, back to the bar fight thing. Do you know how to keep from getting whipped in a bar fight? Even if you are afraid, act like you're not. Yeah. Act like you're not. Even if you ain't the toughest guy in the room, be sure they think you are. If you show yourself to be weak, the enemy's coming to get you. The Bible says that he prowls like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know what that means? He's running around with his mouth open, popping off for whoever will quiver at the popping off. And when you turn around and look right back at him, yeah, that's why we have bullying in school. We didn't have bullying in school in my day. No, you just got one of your buddies and evened it up. One bully against two nice guys, that's even. We didn't have to whip nobody. You just had to tell them you weren't scared of him. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid. If we keep proving ourselves to be afraid, what do you think comes next? The only thing that's still holding this country in one piece, the Christian faith that it was founded on. And one day, there's coming a day when an entity like China that owns your socks and your underwear, I mean, for crying out loud, you can't even, you can't even get dressed in the morning without Chinese in your bedroom. I mean, all the pharmaceuticals, everything you got going on. So, so then what's the next thing they're going to do? When it, if you were going to take over America, what is the first thing you would do? You would dismantle their faith. First thing, you would persecute the Christians. Now, you've got a Chinese communist government that wants to own everything you've got. You've got an Islamic entity that can't stand your guts. We're supposed to be the number one ally to Israel. 
Israel doesn't need a coward for a partner. (laughs) And so what comes next? Persecution. What's he say here, Smyrna? I know y'all been through a lot. I even know the difference between real church and not real church. But the devil's about to test you. And some of you are going to suffer tribulation. Some of you are going to go to jail for 10 days. <coughs> Here's what I think might be happening, maybe. Just from a little spiritual insight, maybe maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not. I'll just put it out there and y'all do whatever you want to do with it. So I'm assuming this thing at Asbury Seminary is for real. And here's what makes me believe it as long as they keep it this way. Every light on, every head up, every eye open. No TV cameras, no fancy ministries, no big bands. They're trying to keep it as pure as possible. That holy presence of God. That began in them 20-somethings. The 20-somethings are huge. I don't know if you remember me going to a deal a couple years ago, and they wanted me to speak to the 20-somethings. And I told y'all, I said, that was the scariest part of the whole weekend for me. Because 20-somethings ask really hard questions. And they want real answers. What if? Because this is happening now on college campuses. There's a lot of other things happening, too, and it's all good. I hope it is. But on college campuses, in this generation, now we're hearing personal stories, not not even associated with that, of that same edge group, Seth, young people who are enduring things that are not going as they planned, but showing full faith in God. A pile of them are unchurched. I'm going to say that makes it easier. And they're coming to a realization of the true presence of God. And so we call it revival, but it's truly awakening. What really happens is what I said earlier, a human comes into contact with the Almighty, for real. And all of a sudden, that human decides to respond. What does a fleshly human really do in the presence of God? First, repent, isn't it? We recognize our unworthiness and His holiness all at the same time. And we begin to repent. And God in His grace and mercy accepts us like we are. He begins the process of regeneration. We begin to come become familiar with the Holy Spirit living within us. You see, you do know that's the difference between a sheep and a goat. The only difference between a sheep and a goat, biblically, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so, you've got this going on, and it begins to multiply. And you're in a people group now that's beginning to experience this very same thing. People are looking at their neighbor and going, what's going on? And all of a sudden, they're overwhelmed. And and then, like I said last week, once you've been regenerated, and once you realize you're forgiven, and once you know you got a second chance, the singing starts. Murph's up there telling us, the Bible says, praise the Lord. Why would an unbeliever play, praise the Lord? You didn't even believe. But now I believe. So I praise the Lord. And this, all this phenomenon begins to happen. Here's the scary part. What if God's raising up a generation in this awakening, in preparation for the persecution that's about to come. You see, I don't think guys like me and Murph know how to equip the next batch for what's coming. Curtis, Joel, all of us been hanging around here a long time, Steve, and Tom. Been hanging around here a long time. I don't think we know how to get them ready for what's coming. I don't know that I'm ready. I've popped off around here for 20 years. I've begged for persecution around here. Our generation doesn't even know what that is. It's like inviting somebody to Sunday school and they turn you down and you think you've been persecuted. 
I think God is in raising up a generation of Daniels, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those who are, will stand because their experience is real and their relationship is real and their indwelling in the kingdom of God is real. They came out of revival. They didn't come out of their mess. They didn't come out of their religion. They're coming out of revival. They're coming out of an awakening in preparation for the task at hand and what's going to be looking them in the face. Our batch is so soft. I have begged for persecution. I've begged for denominational preachers, bring your Bible and come see me. I've begged for Muslims to come through the door and tell me to shut up. Anybody that hates me, please come. The door's unlocked. I can't get one taker. Not one. Not one. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? That we would expect for the kingdom of God to grow in the earth apart from persecution. Because in the patterns of God, the first time at the stoning of Stephen, and the church was scattered, and the persecution and the persecutors like Saul of Tarsus and different ones, where their life was at risk for being a Christian, and the church grew. And it forcefully advanced, and forceful men laid hold of it. And now, in my age, we grew up soft, and we were inundated with fairy tale theologies that said you'd click your heels and beam me up, Scotty, or, you know, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, everything's good, and we're just cozy, and we're all hunky dory, and sure enough, we've been that way the whole time. We've had great church services. Man, we've learned how to hug each other and love each other and hang out. We don't know squat about persecution. We don't know nothing. We love it when we bring somebody in from another country who grew up in the Hindu home or the Islamic home and came to Jesus by personal awakening experience and suffered at the, own hand, at the hands of their own family and stayed hooked and stayed the course. We love to hear those stories. <coughs> I believe God's raising up a batch who's going to be that story right here in what used to be a Christian nation in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I just wonder if the church of Jesus Christ fits in that category of truly free and truly brave. There's a lot of parallels to be drawn in this awakening that's going on. So I want to lay down a little history because I think it'll be beneficial to some people. But in 1736, things began to happen on American soil before there was ever American soil. The land hadn't been covenanted yet. But the Puritans and the Quakers and different ones that were here in the colonies, they began to realize and talk about the fact that their church services had become mundane, and dull, ritualistic. And they recognized it because the generations were becoming highly immoral compared to normal standards. Would there be any similarities today that you drug your kids to a church service that was dull, lifeless, mundane, and as soon as they got smoke over their heads and wheels under their butt, they took off. Lights were on, nobody's home. And the immorality. How many of y'all would know that the immorality of the generations today compared to the immorality of 1736 would be quite a bit different without social media, without Hollywood, without TV screens in every segment of your life. Their immorality was minimal 
compared to how we are today and the things that are available today that are out there to capture the minds and souls of the next batch. They realized this, so they began to enlist anointed preachers. <coughs> and men were called by God. And I'm just going to, I got to refer some to this Founders Bible. I know most of that stuff, but every, I'll have to, I, can't, I brought it tonight so I wouldn't mess anything up. But they began to bring some guys, or, or God began to send them over here, really. Some guys like Samuel Davies, Samuel Edwards, John Wesley, um, George Whitfield. George Whitfield, that was a big one. He did like seven months worth or nine months worth over here. He got to preaching every day, every day, to around 8,000 people. But they preached, all these guys preached the same thing. They preached a true salvation experience where a man becomes born again. Not where you pray a prayer and blow some snot and get the fire insurance. They didn't preach church attendance. They preached recreation of a man's life through the, through the sanctifying, justifying power of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost. They preach freedom in Christ Jesus, and they worship freely. They offered a way to repent, to be born again, and to be forgiven. That's it. George Whitfield walking around without a band or a microphone or a nice building, fluffy chairs, 8,000 a day, till his last day in Boston, 23,000 that day. And the awakening, they called it the awakening. 1740, the awakening came. And out of that awakening, here's a couple things that happened. Let's see, I already told that part. Oh, here's something that happened in the churches that I underlined. A new and irrepressible expectancy entered the life of the churches and a na national sense of intensified religious and moral resolution was born a desire to be righteous became intense throughout society and families began to realign themselves with the word of god and the word of god became important again the great awakening also greatly advanced the cause of education in America, Princeton University was born out of the work of William Tennant Sr. He's the one that started the Log College. Several other early centers of education, such as Rutgers University, University of Pennsylvania, and Brown University, had their beginnings in the enthusiasm of the wave of the new awakening. Now, as I went back and re-looked at all this, and I'm watching Asbury and some different things that's kind of popping up. And I'm, I'm asking God, I said, God, what, 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 are, what are we doing? And he just keeps re redirecting me, as we've done many times here in the last few years, to the awakening of 1740. Out of that awakening came a new education system that man finally got his grip on and took it to the outhouse. But it had its root in the awakening and now right now in some of these education systems there's an awakening happening in this same age group of people george whitfield was 25 years old when he came over here wasn't a bunch of old guys they were on fire for the lord jesus christ and they heard god and whatever he said to do they did it out of that awakening came a free nation out of that awakening you and i enjoy all the benefits of our life out of that awakening could it be that out of this awakening a generation will rise up to be the daniels and the shadrachs and the meshachs and the bendigos that are not afraid of their own shadow they're not afraid of their religion they're not afraid of their neighbor 
<coughs> they're not afraid to trust their God. While they might not, they might be so fearless that they don't even pray for how they want it to turn out. They just live in it. Could it be that the church of Smyrna is on its way again? Young people who will rise up and stand the persecution that causes expansion and holds on to our heritage and holds on to true faith in God because look at us, guys. We've all come out of our own little old stuff, but look at us. We may have, somebody came out of a revival in a tent someplace. Our gen, we didn't come out of revival. We came out of our mess. We just came out of our mess. Most of us came out of our mess. We look around about half dis dysfunctional and cry out to Jesus, and he shows up, and we get born again, and then we go to church, and <laughs> we do all we can to help other people find Jesus. And, man, we're doing the best we can, and we know. I think there's a chance that God has protected us from too, true persecution because I think as a whole, I don't think we can stand it. I think we've had too many little bumps in the road that knocked the cart plum in the ditch to be man enough to stay, hey, whip it on us. Whatever you got going, bring it. No. When they told us as Christians that we didn't want you praying in the name of Jesus anymore at the football game, we said, okay, sorry. We'll be silent for two minutes. Crud, we've been silent ever since. Well, we don't want y'all reading your Bible anymore in public and in school. And Okay, well, shoot, we'll keep it to a minimum on Sunday morning so we don't offend anybody. You know, we just think it ought to be legal all across America that you don't want to have kids, we'll just fix it. Okay, we don't like it, but we'll be over here in our hut and we'll be quiet. So next thing you know, they want your county to be wet. What did I tell this county? I told this county three times they fought us about this, and I said, look, let me tell you people something. Once you crack a door open, you can't shut it. There'll be somebody on that other side, and it's going to get wider. It won't get shut. Whatever you allow in, you won't get rid of. Don't listen to me. I ain't got no letters behind my name. I'm just a team roping cow sale auctioneer that preaches 18 times a week. Don't listen to me. But let me tell you one thing. Wisdom is proved right by our actions. I wasn't wrong. I told him, I said, you just keep it up and there'll be a pot shop on every corner. How many, how many Leonard between Clovis and Portales? 24 pot shops. What's so cool about this is them dumb suckers are going to put each other out of business. <coughs> they're so ignorant and so greedy, they're going to put each other out of business. 24 pot shops. Yeah. They probably don't know that we know it. They're all sitting over there just like young guns. They can't see us. We're in the spirit world. But look what we're doing. So I've examined myself, and I feel like a guy who's fairly bold and fairly up in everybody's face and always tromping around in everybody's business. 27 years. I can't tell that I've done squat. I couldn't hold off one bad decision in this town. Not one. And they're still making them, and they're making them faster than you can invent them now. It's like a contest to see who can be the dumbest, the quickest. It's the truth. And everybody else that goes to church on a Sunday morning has stayed absolutely silent, except for one or two or three or four. We just passively let things happen because we've let our minds be inundated with a story that we wanted to hear 
don't worry. It's all going to be okay. One of these days, we're going to get you out of here. You know what? I got a young couple here that just showed up. They got one of them little dumplings with them. One of these days, the people of God are going to wake up and realize, this ain't about me. It's about them. That's it. The greatest treasure God gave was a son because the generations are right under that. Blessed is a man who has children. A quiver full of them is what Psalms 127 says. But God can see what we can. And I may be totally backwards on this, but I, I hadn't missed that much very often. While I'm teaching out of Daniel yesterday morning, which I thought was one of the most effective teachings I've had ever since we've been here. Most accurate. I began to realize that Daniel was a generation that was raised up for such a time as that. And maybe, just maybe, across the campuses of America, there's a generation being raised up out of revival not out of Sunday school meetings and after-school activities, but out of true revival from the presence of God, born out of repentance, that will raise up a generation that's powerful and unafraid and willing to do this right here. Overcome. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. How many of y'all have gone to church since Moby Dick was a man and you had never heard very much about the second death? He said, but the, in verse 8, chapter 21 of Revelation, but the cowardly, the unbelievable, the unbelieving, the abominable, murder, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. If you want to survive the second death, you got to be an overcomer. Well, how do I do that? I've done all those. You got to be washed in the blood of Jesus. I had to be forgiven. My slate had to be wiped clean. And then I had to be shown to be such that guy by the mark of the Holy Spirit. It says, now you're mine. Bear that mark. How many of y'all in the same theologies have learned to fear the mark of the beast? We've been taught to fear hell, the mark of the beast, a coming tribulation, all kinds of different things we've been taught to fear. If we've been learning to fear, no wonder we were so good at it when COVID got here. That's what we've been practicing. I got an idea. Why don't you just fear the Lord? And why don't you bear the mark of God? If I'm the head, not the tail, and Satan's under my feet, and he's simply an ankle biter, and I bear the mark of God, the power of God, the discernment of God, every gift of God, then why in the world would I fear an ankle biter, and why would I worry about taking the mark? Because the power within me says that I can stand up against persecution. The mark comes with persecution, and standing up or not standing up comes with judgment. When you survive the judgment, you escape the second death. <coughs> he says over here in uh, verse 20, 22, well, I can't, I don't remember where it's at now. It don't matter. But it talks again about the, about the, uh, the second death, or the second judgment and the, the second death. But he says right here, if you overcome, they're going to persecute you, and they're going to put you in jail. But if you overcome, not only will I give you a crown of life, you'll escape the second death. We thought we could do that with simply blowing some snot and praying a prayer. 
but he's telling the church of Smyrna. The last thing I want to tell you, my Christian walk came out of my mess. I was in dire need of a change, just like a lot of you. I, I run the risk of, of losing something I love more than myself. If you love something more than yourself and you think you're going to lose it, you try to figure out a way to get this fixed. Jesus met me in my truck. That's it. Wouldn't be any different than being at Asbury University. He's in my truck. Can't draw you a picture of him? He's in my truck. We had a talk. I repented. I was given a second chance. Didn't have anything figured out. Didn't know doodly squat. Didn't go to church anywhere. Didn't have a Bible. I had a little confirmation Bible somewhere. My mom had it hid out someplace. That's the only one I had. Didn't know where it was. So now I got the rest of my life, I got to figure out who was in my pickup. We've been figuring that out. That's that's <coughs> the whole <coughs> that's the whole story. But in that process, everything changed. And it was very real. And the truth of the matter is, you can't make me a non-believer. Now, you can make me as a believer act bad. I've done that before. But you cannot make me. It's impossible to make me a non-believer. I think that's one of the things that makes me about half crazy and bold and all the things I do. Because you cannot make me a non-believer. It's impossible. That'd be like just holding a gun to my head and telling me, you do not know Alan Smire. Really. You don't. You don't. Tell me you don't know Alan Smire. I can make you believe Alan Smire doesn't even exist. I can make you believe Curtis Preston never, never lived in mule shoe. <coughs> no, you can't. I know them. I know them. You can't make it happen. It, it's impossible. Can I become a non-follower? Absolutely. You can never make me believe because it was a personal experience of a human in the presence of God. And I was awakened in the cab of my pickup. It's no different than what's going on here. My point in all that is I close tonight. Praise God for those young people. They're not following another student or a preacher's direction, but all of a sudden with every head up and every light on, being overwhelmed with the presence of God, that they'll never forget, they'll never deny, and they'll never be able to refuse. If you're going to be a Daniel, you got to be that way. Or you'll just bow your knee to Nebuchadnezzar and you'll deny your faith. Then the mark of the beast begins to matter. Then those things begin to matter. But when it's impossible for you to deny your faith, you'll trust God all the way to the lion's den. You'll trust God all the way to the fire. You won't like it. You might even pray for it not to happen. But sometimes this stuff's going to happen. And sometimes we're going to have to go through it. And God's going to have to be there with us. And I praise God that there's a chance. That there's a generation being raised up. It's not going to just be all clouded up with a bunch of church junk. They're going to know the risen Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God for real because what's coming, they're going to need it. I don't know how to get them ready, but I'll bet you 20 to 1 the Holy Ghost does. I'll bet you 20 to 1 the Almighty knows what he's doing. I don't think this is so we can just have another Azusa Street. 
I think this is generational. I think it's for such a time as this. And I think it's on purpose by the creator of the universe. And I think that if we'll continue to keep it pure, God will be able to do everything he intends to do. And that anointing will continue. And we may have the next awakening since 1740 on this covenanted soil, all to the glory of God. So, that's all I got tonight. Anybody got anything else? How many of y'all think I'm nuts? Raise your hand. Huh? Been nuts a long time. Y'all keep coming back. You know what? You know what's sad though, truly. I always feel like I'm on edge because sometimes I feel like I'm the only guy saying this stuff. I mean, it that does suck sometimes because you look at yourself and you go, "Am I crazy?" And then you'll wait ten years and realize you've been right the whole time. But I don't have any letters behind my name. I don't have the stuff. I can't even get a crowd anymore because the monkey with everything anybody ever believed in. So it really messes people up. But I don't believe there's a, an awakening happening on our soil this time after everything we've taught and drove all over this country teaching about covenant and the Mayflower Compact, freedom, and the awakening of 1740, the men of 1776, and how God has been involved in our life the whole time. And I don't think you just wake up 400 years later and go, oh, cool, those kids are all getting saved. No, I think there's more to it than that. But I think if you haven't dug down deep in that word, and you haven't sought the Spirit of God and His counsel, you're not going to see it, and you're not going to hear it. And so if you're just a goofy cow sale auctioneer and you've been doing that, when you say it, you sound like a weirdo. There's not another preacher in this town saying it. I can guarantee that. They can't risk the empty seat. That's just the truth. I can't risk my grandchildren. I can risk the empty seat. You people don't make my living. I'm fine. But I can't risk the next bat. So if this is what God's up to, then glory to God. So that's all I got. I'm going to pray us out of here. Lord, I just want to thank you for your word tonight. I hope these insights are yours. I'm sure they are, Lord, but convey a message that's only from you we thank you lord for what you're doing we thank you for this country we live in we thank you for our family we thank you for your word help us jesus to do right by you <coughs> to live it out right where we're at and lord i pray that these words will be the meditations of our heart that each man will figure it out for themselves God, I don't want them to listen to me and just go accept it at face value. I want, I pray, Lord, that you'll draw every one of us in, that we'll examine things and look at things for ourselves, that we'll seek counsel from you, God. And I pray for everyone in the sound of my voice that doesn't know you, that this personal encounter will happen and happen immediately. God, they'll find themselves face to face with you, the living God. I bless you tonight, Lord, and pray blessings over every family represented here tonight. Speak blessings over their home. In Jesus' name, amen.